and let's get moving with your good stuff. Okay. Okay, do you see it? Yes, yep, we do. Yep. All right. That's always a good start. So welcome, everybody. And thank you, Deb, for um, uh, hosting me again today. And I'm just getting a few things off my screen so I can see it a little bit better. Um, so as um, uh, this is my second time, uh, being in your space, and I'm really excited to be uh, welcome back. So I'm in Minnesota, and I'm an educational consultant. Um, my background is in uh, t being a teacher for students with visual impairments, but I'm also a related service provider in that I'm a certified orientation and mobility specialist. So I have a couple of hats that I've had on for many, many years. And because of those many years, I have evolved and responded to many things over the years of being um, a teacher, consultant, and orientation and mobility specialist. So what I'm going to share with you um, today is, is um, um, these practices, but I'm gonna start with what I call a pop start. So it's like getting, getting us into the same space. A few things, Pop Start comes from watching the Today Show in the morning and getting some news. And they just kind of uh, give you some ideas to get us all in the same space. And so I just want to share with you a little bit about reflective practice. That's really important to me. That's that evolving and responsive um, professionalism. That's where my 25 strategies I chose for you this morning come from. So reflective practice is a deliberate pause to assume an open perspective. It allows for those higher level thinking processes and it's to examine beliefs, goals, and practices, and hopefully gaining some newer, deeper understandings that lead to actions that ultimately what it's all about is our students and our children and it improves learning for our students and, and children. And this definition comes from Jennifer York Barr in her book, Reflective Practice to Improve Schools. And she uh, was at the University of Minnesota. So the other idea is, is that I'm sharing uh, through my reflective practice, my golden nuggets. So you see this uh, old miner, you know, mining for gold, and he's shifting through all the, the sand, right? All the content, all the sand, and coming up with some gold nuggets. So um, for those of you who are experienced people, you're going to see gold nuggets that you already know. So it's going to reinforce what you know, and maybe give you um, impetus to share the, your golden nuggets with other people. And if you're a new, newer service provider, maybe this will help you shift through um, all the stuff out there and deciding where do I start, what do I do, and where do I go? And just a little bit about informing our work together. And here I have a photo of um, a friend of mine who's blind and um, she's in some of the photos. Um, she's um, 14, I mean, 12 years old now. So I've known her a long time, but here we are picking strawberries together. You know, and it's awfully hard to find time to just go uh, pick strawberries with a student and show them uh, a whole different way of being because there are so many competing priorities for our time with children. And so I just try to think about all these strategies that help me increase my time with children because there's so many other things going on that de make demands on us. So as we begin, I want you to think about um, three practices or strategi strategies that make a difference in your work. So think about if you were going to be presenting this this morning, 
what what would you be sharing? So just three strategies that really make a difference and, and do learning, uh, improve learning outcomes for kids. And then what informs your practice? You know, I, I, I just mentioned that um, it's all those competing priorities, but what informs um, what you do with children? So just think about that as I start moving forward. So my agenda this morning is to talk about effective strategies. They're kind of, I, I decided to do them around six areas, parents and families, specialized instruction. And just so you know, I think that whatever we do, whether we're therapists and a different kind of related service provider, a teacher, it's all teaching. So I use the term teaching and instruction for um, whenever we're trying to um, instruct and be with children and change children. Um, also around paraprofessionals, accommodations, services, and showing up. And then um, time for reflective dialogue, or we you can ask your questions while I'm talking, and then a little bit of time for technical assistance case studies. And I have an example um, to share with you. So um, we're going to launch into this now. So parents and caregivers. So strategy number one, be a guest. And I have a photo here of um, Evie who I showed in the uh, previous photo. Here she is with her brother, Ethan, who's also blind and their older brother, uh, Jax, who's fully sighted. And they live in my community. So be a guest. Um, I was really influenced by um, a Dutch philosopher, Henri Nouwen. And he said um, in a book, our children are our most important guests who enter into our home, ask for careful attention, stay for a while, and then leave to follow their own way. So the, his idea of all of us as parents and families that our children, our guests in our lives was a big idea for me that I hadn't thought about. And, and what I did was take that idea and, and think about it as, as I'm a guest in the lives of our families. And really the only reason for um, being involved with our families is because they happen to have a child with a disability. And so I, um, I take that, um, that idea of being a guest in, in the lives of the families of a child with a disability as really important because I think it shapes how I approach and then it, um, communicate and, and, and work with families. So I just, my reflection about being a guest is how does being a guest inform the process and decisions we make for children. Because I think if we think about ourselves as a guest, um, it, it might change and influence um, how we integrate with families. So strategy number two, autonomy. Um, so autonomy, um, my orientation to that comes um, from medical uh, ethics. And um, for 30 years, I was on the medic uh, medical ethics committee for our community hospital. And I was a community member. And um, that was a pretty powerful experience for me over 30 years. And autonomy is one of those principles. And it means a patient has the ultimate decision-making and responsibility for their own treatment. So the photo here I have, is um, street crossings and people walking across the street. And I just use that as an example because as an orientation and mobility specialist, I have to give a lot of autonomy to families about when they think it's okay for their child to learn to cross the street. And I just use that example because it's incredibly variable as to um, when parents think it's okay to allow their child to have more independence. 
So in, in thinking about that autonomy is um, thinking about parents and caregivers as equal partners. And um, we know we need to do that, but putting it into practice is, is where we can evolve and respond to all the families and, and um, context we have experience with. So I just um, asked myself the question, who's in charge? And who's in charge of children is, is their parents and caregivers. And um, I try to always remember that when um, I'm sitting in a team uh, and we're making decisions about children. And um, I just want um, to use the term and share with you um, professional privilege. This is a term that I've been um, uh, evolving with. And um, I also am a, what informs my practice also is um, that I'm uh, sometimes a, a consultant advocate for families where they hire me. And I've been doing that for, oh, 30 some years. And, and when you come in, um, to support families, um, I've evolved in looking at how professionals relate to um, parents as a team and so forth. And there's this concept of professional privilege that, that I see sometimes. And, and um, it's because of what we know and what we do, and we know we have answers, we, we know what should occur, but we still um, need to, like at the base, be listening to parents. So that's where that concept of um, strategy three comes in and really applying mutuality. So when you, I have a, a photo here of um, tennis partners and think about all the mutuality that has to go in if you're playing doubles in tennis and how you really have to work together. So, we think about the ideas of respect, understanding, having an open mind, and as a professional, being able to let go of some of our own things, um, willing to change, for example, goals, willing to do what parents want as goals, um, being open to ongoing learning and learning from every family context we're involved in. Um, and learning new ways to be informed and um, having a sense of equity. And what really informed my work in terms of mutuality um, was I've spent um, 20 some years working in a part of our world called Micronesia. And I've um, uh, been there many, many times. And I had to really learn to let go of my own professionalism, my own Western culture, and, and work with them in mutuality. And um, it, it really, uh, I had to really evolve and respond. So now I'm gonna move to a few things called specialized instruction. And, um, and I just got a kick out of Deb referring to um, routines and procedures or whatever word you use, Deb, at the beginning of the session and how we know it's important to all of us. And bingo, number one, it is so important to get good responses out of children using procedures and routines. Now, why? Why is it important? Because it gives kids predictability. It increases their familiarity. It, it develops automaticity, which is really important to learning, which all those things then build a child's confidence and then gives them success. So that's why it's so important. And it's important for all children. And in this photo, um, you see um, my friend Evie, she was um, learning some procedures and routines to develop her tactile skills, her tactile discrimination skills to get really finer and finer for being able to read braille. And she's um, learning from a, uh, a tutor who, um, I was um, tutoring uh, to teach and, and Chelsea, she's from Micronesia, the island called Chu. And I have a link on this slide, which is called What is Explicit Instruction? And it's a special education resource project at Vanderbilt University. 
and they have really uh, honed in on these different practices in terms of explicit instruction and procedures and routines are part of that. And I think it's just a good overall resource. Strategy five is about preferences. And this all is not new to us, but I wanna emphasize this is a gold nugget and you get better results when you use student preferences. So in this photo, you see Ethan, <clears throat> and he was reluctant about um, learning a, uh, how, using his cane and using it to get to his neighbor's house. So I just used his preferences and brought in other children and the children happened to be my grandchildren. And we just turned uh, an orientation and mobility lesson using a cane um, into a game and with peers. And um, I used his preferences and we called it a penny walk and the kids got pennies for doing different skills. So we know that when we use highly preferred content, it leads to number one cooperation. So I got a huge amount of cooperation from him when I used this, um, used his preferences. Um, you get increased understanding and then you can move it out of preferred content into less preferred by going first this, which is doing something less preferred and then moving to something more preferred. So you get cooperation and then you can scaffold instruction that way. So number six, turn taking. Another big, big way to make uh, learning more engaged. So the benefits of taking turns and no matter what you're teaching is you can bring in instructional variety and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. You can increase participation and you increase communication. So in this photo, um, you see Ethan in, with um, a braille writer in braille and I just brought in peers, um, his brother and my grandson to take turns in terms of writing braille. And so then he had this um, experience of it's all kids, it's everybody, it's turn taking, we're playing a game. So the strategies around turn taking, the one that I always use, I call them learning cards or flashcards. So we push out a lot of content, especially for literacy in terms of cards. So I always make two. So for example, if I'm using the alphabet cards for something or picture cards for something, I always make a set of two, because if you have two, you can play a game and, or you can always send them home too. But if you have two, you can play a game. And I always try to create game context. So if you just always have spinners with you or dice, you can engage in turn taking in those ways. So strategy seven is explicit guidance. So. Prompts and praising. So one of the things when I'm working with people as a coach is I really, really try and home in on their guidance around prompting and praising. So for example, in this, um, I, I talk about using explicit praise and explicit correction procedures. So in this illustration, I have a person who's saying good job, which is something we routinely say to children and change it into, in terms of being explicit, holding your fork in your hand was awesome. So whatever the child is doing that you like, that's an improvement, um, you be explicit about that. Now, a lot of um, my experience in being more explicit comes from teaching children who are blind, because if I just say good job, they may have no idea what I'm talking about by good job. So I had to learn to be very explicit, but then I do that for all children. And I find that if they have a better understanding of what I think is good and what I like in, in terms of seeing them do it. And then in terms of correction procedures and prompting, I um, try to limit 
um, question asking. So for example, if, if you give a direction or ask a question and the child does not respond, I try to work with people to not repeat the same thing, um, but correct the child with giving more information. Like nice try, um, now do this and, and whatever it is I'm teaching. So I also like to use tell me or show me um, and, and rather than ask questions because they may not respond to questions um, because of their communication skills. Strategy number eight is about frequency. <laughs> Anybody who works with me, and if you don't learn anything else from me this morning, um, it's about frequency. And this is an evidence-based strategy for all children, no matter what, um, what is being taught and at what level. So um, in this photo, I have an actual uh, display uh, for um, tactile uh, symbols that is used for a student I consulted with. And um, when we try to increase frequency of teaching or doing anything with a child, we look at access. So you see how this is, these cards are, symbols are displayed. Um, they're accessible, they're easily used. They allow people to increase the opportunities uh, for a student to use the symbols. And I just want to share with you, I have a link um, to the IRIS modules. I don't know if you know about the IRIS modules. Um, they're at Vanderbilt University. And, you know, I hadn't looked at them in a long time. They've been around for a long time, um, but they really have added to their content and they're an awesome resource. Um, so I just happened re to look up um, uh, frequency and, and I have the link to what they say about changing intervention around dosage and time to increase frequency. But what I wanna share with you is um, they talk about always increasing um, your time. And what I wanna suggest to you is that to get more opportunities and to increase frequency. I use an uh, uh, instructional strategy that I call quick tasks. And so it's not increasing time, but it's increasing the opportunity. So for example, if I am teaching um, tactile discrimination of items and, and once a day isn't enough, and maybe I want it five times a day, so I set up um, materials like what you might see here. So the, it, for example, a paraprofessional or another teacher um, can just bump in and do these quick tasks and not take 15 minutes. But if you've got three minutes, you can increase the opportunity in, a frequent, in the frequency that a child um, uh, is engaged in an activity where they need to learn something. And um, uh, so that, that's um, moving us to strategy nine, which is variety. So this is the second thing. It's about frequency and variety. So variety is also an evidence-based practice. And so if you vary your presentation methods, vary materials and vary formats. Now, I have also said procedures and routines are important, but now I'm saying use variety. So once you have procedures and routines established, then introduce variety. And, and that, that keeps kids um, uh, interested. Um, and uh, you might come across different ways where they'll learn better. And in this photo, we have um, uh, Chelsea changing um, a, a variety of when she was teaching Ethan about Braille instruction, Braille um, alphabet and so forth, Braille reading. And she was putting it into a game 
and varying um, that traditional way of working at a table. So the variety is a really important strategy. So I'm gonna move to paraprofessionals. So Deb, how do you think I'm doing and moving through these at lightning speed? <laughs> You're being very thorough with your comments and uh, I, I'm, I'm just looking forward to seeing how you pull it off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna keep going and because I'm not looking at the chat, but if somebody, is, puts in something or wants to say something, let me know, okay? Well, we're monitoring it, so you just do your thing and we'll do ours. Okay, thanks, Deb. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, strategy 10, paraprofessionals. I decided to put in something about paraprofessionals because I work with paraprofessionals a lot over the years. With, with the students I have, uh, most of them have lots of needs, and I work a lot with paraprofessionals. So I decided that I would share um, some strategies um, around working with paraprofessionals. So this is what this is really important to me. Um, I really believe in intensive training, and if you look at the illustration that I've created here, it's about training time for paraprofessionals. So if you look at the, the pyramid, if you will, the paraprofessionals are at the, the bottom of the pyramid. Then we have the teachers and then we have administrators. And then on the left-hand side, I have an arrow going up the pyramid to the top. And then on the uh, right-hand side, there's an arrow going down. Now, if you look at the arrow going up, it talks about time and training. So paraprofessionals, have the least amount of time and training in my uh, many years of experience. Then we have teachers and then we have administrators who get a lot of training. And then when you compare to that to who is the most time with students, paraprofessionals have the most time with students actually. And they have more time with students than a lot of teachers do and certainly administrators. So. If we ask the question, who spends the most time with students? I think it's paraprofessionals, but they get the least amount of training. So I give a lot of attention to paraprofessionals. I believe in intensive training for paraprofessionals. My experience is I get much better student results if I have what I call highly trained paraprofessionals. So, um, some of this may make you itch and twitch because it's gonna be about our time. And as um, itinerant people uh, and with uh, having a lot of demands on our time, um, I'm just gonna jump into this though. So I really believe training in authentic, authentic settings. So wherever the student is, wherever the paraprofessional is, that's where we need to show up to train the paraprofessional. And that, that really impacts our schedule and our flexibility. Um, but there's always a payoff um, for doing intensive training in authentic settings. And then that initial training with a paraprofessional show up with greater fre frequency. So this also impacts a schedule. But for example, when I'm training a paraprofessional who's working with a blind student who needs orientation and mo mobility supports, who's using assistive technology and who might be using braille. Um, I, at the beginning of the school year, I prioritize um, that student um, and students who are similar to that. And I will show up three days in, in a row to work and train the paraprofessional. And for the first day, I do it all day. And the second day, um, I do it um, all day too. So that's really hard to do, but there's a payoff. So I'm gonna talk about coaching. So I think it's really important to develop your own coaching model. Here's my coaching model. And I've put this, um, in where your resources are as a Word document, this 
this illustration. So you can take it and shape it and make it your own coaching model. But I role model everything. I believe that paraprofessionals need to see me do something in order to understand it. So when you look at my coaching model, I first role model a technique and the learner or the paraprofessional in this case observes. And then I move to doing an explicit description of what the what I just role modeled and what the person observed. Because what I've learned through the years is if I just demonstrate, but don't do the talk, the person may not really get and understand what I did. So I give an explicit description about what I just taught, why I taught it, and engage then with the learner uh, with some in reflective inquiry, some question asking. And then, and then as the coach, then I observe the learner apply the technique and, and do some guidance. And then we move to this guidance dialogue. We're all, always talking about what we're doing and what we're seeing. And then I use that word mutual engagement so that I get the paraprofessional comfortable with this whole model and that we're gonna talk a lot and we're gonna share a lot and we're gonna do a lot of shaping. Then I demonstrate again and adjust what we're going to do and ask the learner to apply the adjustments and then start at the beginning. Now, I do this all without thinking, but. I, I learned to be explicit about my model. And um, I get much better results with paraprofessionals, which ultimately is better results for the student or the learner. So when I'm working with paraprofessionals, I, I, I say I do the walk, not just the talk. Um, so, that's strategy 11. Strategy 12 is guiding access and participation. Again, it's about authentic settings. And, and when you work in authentic settings, what, what it allows you to do is demonstrate problem solving. So in this photo is um, when I'm in the role of an orientation and mobility specialist. And this was a student of mine who was a kindergartner and um, this is in the spring of the year. And it was a spring where we didn't have snow on the ground like we do now. But um, the student had to learn a lot to be independent going from the vehicle where she was dropped off and getting to the kindergarten classroom. And I worked with the paraprofessional and, and getting the student to what it looks like now. So she's using her cane, she's pulling her backpack, and she has a route that she's learned to get to the front door of the school. It's not right at the end of the sidewalk here. There are turns, there are steps, there are ramps to get to the front of the building. But to get to this kind of student result, um, uh, I had to show up um, with the paraprofessional and, and really um, uh, use that coaching model um, to, to get this. And, and I use, I talk about problem solving because when I show up, uh, there's always something to figure out with a student. And then if I'm in the authentic context, the paraprofessional can see and learn from how I'm problem solving and, and um, changing instruction. And so then the other thing of, that's uh, I learned uh, to do with paraprofessionals is really pace change. The, when I show up and see what's going on with the student, I'm usually going, oh my goodness, I need to change about 20 things that are going on here. And, and I can't. So if you look at this illustration, it looks like, look at a green leaf going to a fall color, but look at all the steps, all the colors in between and, and the process of change. So that's just a metaphor for me to use with you to look at, we have to pace change with paraprofessionals. 
it has to be done mutually. We have to be conscious of their comfort level in terms of rate of, rate of change. And there's a term I use a lot with paraprofessionals working with kids in terms of stepping in, stepping out. And um, so you step in to provide guidance and then you step back out to let the student demonstrate what they've learned. And um, that's part of that whole um, change, pacing change, and um, allowing the student to show us um, uh, how, how fast or slow we need to go. So strategy- And Donna, did you say that you had a case study for us today as well? Yes, I, I mean, it's a, a compilation. Okay, I just want to point out that if we talk about a case study that we usually need to start those by about five till or on the hour, and you have 11 strategies left before that. So I love your explanation, but just wanted to make sure that you're not rushed for time. Okay, thank you. Uh, so strategy 14, again, it's all about student results. And here's Evie when she learned to be more independent with her socks and boots and so forth. So uh, the whole thing with paraprofessionals is focusing on student outcomes. Um, I'm very explicit so they can see how the student is changing and showing more su uh, success. I use a lot of rubrics. Um, so we can really break it down and do task analysis or forward and backward chaining and so forth so that they can see the smaller steps for where uh, students are being successful. I share the student results because it develops pride in the paraprofessional. So st strategy 15 is always praise with the paraprofessional. And one of the things that I try to stay conscious of is para vulnerability. Um, there's a, a lot of stuff that can go on in the culture and context of a school with paraprofessionals. And when I'm asking them to step back or step in, or they get all this training, sometimes um, they have to manage how their peers see them. And um, I'm just saying that um, there's some vulnerability, I think, with paraprofessionals in schools. So that phrase is really important. It builds their confidence. So a little bit on accommodations. And this may be, a, I'm going to take you down maybe a little path that you're going to be totally not thinking about in terms of accommodations, because we're usually thinking technology and, and so forth. So strategy 16 is about think aspirations in terms of accommodations. So I'm doing a whole mindset shift from viewing accommodations from a need-based origin to thinking through accommodations from an asset-based origin. And a lot of this comes from my years in dealing with what I call reluctant users of accommodations. And I think there's a lot of reasons for reluctant users. I think it's about identity formation of um, the students and how they see themselves. And um, this tension of between what we think should be done as adults and what students want to do in terms of their own self-determination or families and parents. So I'm, I have changed my um, language from when I'm with people in terms of, I don't say, this is what you need, or this is a need. It's more, what do you aspire to? What do you want to achieve? What do you want to do? Now in the paperwork, I have to use need, but um, in my talk, I can use um, other things. So um, strategy 17 is think opportunities. And what I've done is just inserted a little bit about my own personal journey. So you see a photo of my husband, Roger, He's got Parkinson's disease, and um, and in living with him for uh, over ten years with a degenerative condition, it has certainly informed uh, my practice um, as as a, a teacher and orientation mobility special specialist with accommodations. 
So it's about um, thinking about opportunities. So he didn't want to hear about needs, but we do opportunity talk. So you see him in a park that's by our house here, and it's an asphalt trail. And um, he started having very limited mobility. And so if I were to say, you need to use a rollator, he didn't like that idea. He didn't want to see himself as needing a rollator. But when I talked about opportunities and um, sensitive to the fact of going public and walking with a rollator, um, and then as I supported him in his own self-disclosure, um, it really changed his use of accommodations. And it helped me understand my students a little bit more. So then choices, strategy 18. Um, think about our own bias in giving choices. This is a student I consult with, Katie, and um, she's blind and has many challenges, those neurodevelopmental challenges we see in a lot of our students. <laughs> Katie wanted to play the cello and her family supported her in the cello. And um, we gave her the choice of playing cello and band. So think about what works, include others, and you know, to support Katie and using the cello um, certainly took a huge team of teachers and peers supporting her. And I just say, when you're looking at accommodations for whatever a child aspires to, simply try and simply teach and have that inform what you do. Now, a few things on services. Um, I try to put time for children first. And just in this illustration, you see somebody who just looks truly overwhelmed. Um, stuff gets in the way of what we need to do and putting children first. It's time, it's forms, it's agendas, decisions, systems, expectations, tensions, stress. Could be car problems, technology problems. So I just try to just stay informed about putting children first. Um, in terms of services, a strategy I do in trying to support children first is I chunk for change if I need to teach them something. Um, and change their behavior. So part of that is understanding behavior change. If you look at yourself and how hard it is to change your behavior, and if you only have the opportunity to change a behavior once a month, when maybe a specialist shows up or once a week, it, 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 the change may not happen. So I like to focus on what it is a child is learning I like to be explicit about it and be frequent. So then I have to chunk my time and maybe not do it once a week or once a month, but show up several times in the week when I am trying to push out a change. And then I'm really big on co-teaching or collaboration, especially as an itinerant person. So that co-teaching, and here we have Katie with her teacher, who co-teaches and collaborates. She's in a classroom, a technology classroom and using specialized um, technology, Braille technology with Katie. Um, if you co-teach, you can get to frequency. It gives you opportunity to observe. Uh, observation is really important. It's stepping back and see the results of your doing. It helps problem solve. And I love that term transdisciplinary. It means sharing what you know and having another person share what they know so you can um, improve the opportunities um, for learning. And then communication. You know, we've all had a lot about communication, but I'm just going to say I give it 24 hours. If somebody asks me a question, or especially if it's a little itchy twitchy, I don't reply right away. I give it 24 hours, I say less. I invite responses or turn taking. I always share my thank you and share appreciation when somebody initiates um, that. So showing up. So I'm running a few minutes late, Deb, but- You're doing uh, great. Okay. <laughs> um, great strategy. strategies, thank you. Okay, three more guys. So this illustration is that 
uh, there's a sea of gray umbrellas and then a, a yellow one. And that yellow one is being authentic. So show up um, and be bring your authentic self. So that's showing up with your integrity. It's showing up and being transparent. And I had a dad once say to me, Donna, I would like you back involved with our son's team. Um, because when you come to the table, when you're at the IEP meeting and, and so forth, it always is so helpful because you share what you know. And I say to him, but I also share what I don't know. See, so that's bringing your authentic and being transparent. When um, I don't know something, I say I don't know it, but I'll get back to you on it. And then being authentic is, is parents, um, it's really hard for them. Uh, and we don't, we don't always know when it's really hard for them. And they may show up a meeting and just cry. And I just say, cry with them, change the agenda, um, stop what you're doing and be in that space, be authentic. Um, uh, let that professionalism slide off a little bit. So part of that being authentic and having a integrity is understanding bias, strategy 24. I'm just going to increase your awareness about all the different aspects of bias. Um, there's organizational bias. So for example, I worked for an organization, a teaching, um, you know, a, te a school district here for 32 years. And then I stepped away and became a consultant. But I'm going to tell you that it wasn't, th it, it took three years of being away from my organization, my school district, to understand that I made decisions based on that organization when I was there, rather than some things maybe I thought that were best for a child. So there's organizational bias we're a part of that we, we may not be conscious of. There's personal bias. We have our own stories, our own journeys that influence our thinking and, and how we make decisions. And I'm not saying these things are right or, right or wrong. I'm just saying understand it um, and that it's present when we're teaming and at the table and influencing a family and a child. Then there's societal and cultural bias wherever we are. And then there is disability bias. And I think as advocates for children with disabilities, we, we um, see that and know that. So strategy 25 is finding joy in our work. And so, I find joy. So this is a photo of me in um, an outer island in the um, uh, uh, island of Chuk in Micronesia. And um, I think for, for joy in our work is, is thinking boldly. So believe boldly about the children. Think boldly about the children. Teach bold, boldly and celebrate boldly and you'll experience joy in your work. So that's my 25 strategies. So um, we, I, we have time then in the agenda, I, if we wanna do a little reflective dialogue or move to the case studies, Deb, you help me with guidance here, please. Well, I, I think that if people have questions, uh, certainly we can give them a couple of minutes. I think uh, as I reflect on the things you said, they all make sense with great, uh, great focus on the communication and relationship. And, and I love that piece because over the last few years, we've had lots of ups and downs, but the joys and the, uh, the things that we celebrate the most are the times whenever we connected with people. And those are the, the those things resonate resonate through all of the people that you're working with. Parents, paras, uh, every piece comes uh, with a message of kindness and acceptance. And so anybody who has additional comments or uh, questions, let's just pause for a moment and give you time, give you a couple minutes, and then we'll jump into the case study.
Anything that you want to share? Everyone must be listening very intently. Well, they are and in processing it. And again, things that just make sense, but sometimes you need a reminder to bring them to the forefront. So uh, I think the time for asking questions is not passed. Feel free to type in the chat box, but let's go ahead, Donna, and move forward with, okay. Uh, Michael would like to say, I'd like to think of this entire process with families and children as collaborations. And and you're right, kids are pretty smart regarding therapy if we just listen to them. So that really ties into a number. Uh, Michael, was there anything else that you wanted to say about that? Okay, good comment. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Okay, okay, Thanks. thank you for that. And yeah. um, so we have other comments. I appreciate what you have shared and the timing of it. Um, and, you know, as we're coming to all of our meetings and so right now we're all ready to glide into uh, spring break, but we got lots of work to go before uh, we finish for the year. Seem like best practices, especially as service providers, says Brittany, uh, like the reminder of frequency when learning new skills. So it's it's all of your strategies, great reminders. Again, we still welcome questions and comments, but take us home with this, Donna. Okay, great. Um, I I don't um, have more slides, so I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. Perfect. Um, so that I can see some faces and some names. Um, so in terms of um, uh, case study, you know, um, what I want to share with you is is um, some action research that um, I learned over time uh, with some students. And action research, um, if you're not familiar with the term, it's it's really your own research based on your own practice, and it, and it, it informs. Um, um, what works with with kids, and um, so it's not just what we might think of as clinical research or research in a higher ed or you know that academic research, but it's that more practical um, research through through actual teaching that it informs our practice. And one of the contexts and. Uh, that um, I've been involved with in many years is is working with children. You know, we call them complex kids now, right? So um, they may have many disabilities and many conditions um, uh, that um, make it difficult to make progress and learn skills and so forth. So um, in in my context, they're generally blind. Um, they generally uh, have um, not a lot of expressive communication. There's usually gaps um, uh, in expressive communication. So it's, it's hard to know what they know or for them to show what they know. There's um, motor skills, low tone stuff, um, gaps in movement um, that all that gastrointestinal stuff, a lot of eat, uh, difficulty with eating, um, a lot of challenges with fine motor and holding things and um, discriminating tactily. And, um, you know, it's the, it's, it's the whole thing, right? <laughs> and so for these kids, it's really important um, for kids who are blind to like really work on literacy skills, you know, and it's going to be tactile if they're blind. And so I've over, I'd say, mm, oh, it might be close to 20 years now. Um, I've worked with about 15 students who um, teams decided that a student was not going to learn Braille. Um, because of all the learning challenges. Yet there would was somebody on the team, and oftentimes because of the kind of work I do, it would be a parent who's, who would really want their child to learn Braille. 
And so part of this really started with students I had when I was a teacher um, here in this area. And um, I think about my one student who, who hadn't had a lot of preschool experiences and then showed up for kindergarten with a lot of these challenges. And um, right away, we made a lot of progress and a lot of his goals in terms of mobility, fine motor, communication, eating. Um, but he didn't make progress in, in um, literacy skills and um, in this case, learning Braille. So we really had to dig deep into um, how are we going to do this? And so um, over the years, um, those in, some of those instructional gold nuggets came with working with all my students who, um, needed to develop braille literacy skills. But there's some universal strategies. And, and what I did was um, really examine, and I really tried to imagine um, what was going on in the brain. And he, this is what I wanna tell you guys, is I think in our future, in the next 10 years, 20 years, what's gonna inform what we know and do and teach and support kids with disabilities is gonna be what we learn about the brain. I really think that's going to inform our next steps in, in, in teaching and how we know how to do it better. So I was just trying to focus on um, these kids who are blind with all these complex needs and what's going on in their brain. So one of the things that I decided early on was when we're always talking at them and saying so much that what's going on in the brain and all that speech and language was overriding what was going on with their touch. And so one of the str overall strategies I did was when I was teaching tactile discrimination, I really, limited my language. And I did it more through guidance and tactile guidance of, of what they needed to touch. And I started with um, grosser items for sorting. That was something that they'd be initially successful at and was um, not such a difficult tactile skill. And then I moved them along from you know, using their whole hand for tactile discrimination to moving to their fingers. And then finally, what's under their fingertip because that's where Braille is and starting to discriminate. And it, it's, a, it, it's like an 18 step process. But what I wanna share with you is, is by really examining our strategies and using those strategies like procedures and routines and frequency and um, collaborating and sharing those with others so that the, the children have that frequency and variety. All those students learn Braille. And, um, and, and it was when other people thought they would not have the uh, capabilities to learn Braille. So I just wanted to share with you this you know, combined like strategy of, of really um, stepping back and using that reflective um, practice and that inquiry and, and stepping in and really trying to discern um, what it is um, that's gonna make a difference in a child's learning. Um, so that's what I wanted to share. Thank you, Donna. And, and, and it always helps to bring it to a face and, a, and an individual. Yes, we know that um, the strategies and, and sometimes we do make several red letter activities at the same time. So I like what you just said about uh, I'm if I'm teaching somebody the Braille piece, it's going to be maybe with something fun. So I'm not asking them to uh, learn the Braille and be testing them on the content at the same time, uh, just doing 
in one, what is my goal here? Improving the literacy. Well, then let's focus on that and not throw uh, all kinds of other uh, stipulations in there at that point. And so I think that really it helps you to be more explicit and to focus in on the learning that needs to happen. So Deb, um, thanks for your response. And what I wanna share is I, I don't like to use this word, but um, because I think it misrepresents what we're doing, but it's simplify. And, and but people uh, can think um, the wrong way about the term simplify, which means make it easier for a person or have less expectations. And I don't mean that, but it just means narrow the scope of what you're focusing on. And we're not simplifying it to make it, to make it easier. Well, I, I know where you're coming from. It's really hard to right, verbalize. Right. <laughs> we're not, it's and so often we hear the term like dumbing it down so that, and I hate that term, but I think you know what I'm talking about. So anybody who has a better term, but, but you're taking it and bringing it down to such a level that um, it's not challenging for the individual. And so simplifying it is making sure that you're not focused on 20 different goals at the same time. Less is more. Yes, thank you for that. <laughs> Less is more. It's it's not talking about the content, changing content. It's talking about changing your plan for support. Yes. Thank okay. I, and, and I'm with you and we can stop the recording now, I think, Chandra. Uh, but I'm with you and that sometimes over time,